Dzień dobry Państwu. Rozpoczynamy pierwszą sesję, która jest słowo na Ok, so let us open the first session. It will consist of three presentations rather than four, but we will start with an outstanding speaker, Professor Gzel, who will talk to us about avant-garde, obviously. Professor, over to you. Oh, I just wanted to check if every, everything is working, but it seems to be just fine. Dear panelists, dear colleagues, the title of my presentation is displayed on the screen. Avant-garde, is it a gesture or a duty? This title is inspired by my memories from this conference because I've been coming here every single year from the very beginning and I bore you with my presentations, with my papers. As I recalled just a couple of days ago when I was uh, preparing a short written text, I remembered something I said just 20 years ago during a conference. At some point, we talked about a theory for its own sake, not about a great architectural theory, a great urban planning theory, just a great theory for the theory's own sake. In a text that was published next to mine, when I mentioned this theory for its own sake, was a text by Professor Kozłowski. And in that text, Dariusz Kozłowski said that there were no architectural currents at that point. There was only this original creative activity. Acting on his or her own account and a great theory of architecture or any attempts were missing. So, so we had a lot of theories but none of them were followed consistently. Let me tell you that this fragmentation of our circles means that no avant-garde can be identified. So we had groups of people that uh, associated around a specific concept, around a specific direction. That was the situation for many years. And even when the activity of CM was questioned as an avant-garde, that was done by another group, a group that even had the word team in its name. So it was not a single architect, but a group that shared the same views. And then the story repeated itself. So dispersed masters of modernism attempted to present their views on the architecture and hence the first Biennale of Architecture in terms of La Presenza del Passato. And the situation once again repeated itself. Once postmodernism started to be the song of the past and we started talking about reconstruing, once again it was decided to showcase this path towards deconstruction at an exhibition in the US at MoMA where several creators associated to make this exhibit. So the question is whether we should really join such a group or rather not. 
So Gary concluded that he himself didn't identify as a deconstructionist. So he pursued his project following his own the theory of architecture, but because he refused to participate uh, at the Presenza del Passato exhibition, Nobody speaks of him as, a, or nobody spoke of him as a progressive architect, and he feared that he would be omitted. As a result, he decided to join the exhibit. So uh, this is what he said in an interview. But let's conclude one thing. Not all of us have had the chance to become part of these strong uh, recognized teams such as SIAM, and not all of us had Aldo Rossi as a friend, not all of us have been invited to participate in major exhibitions. And maybe that was the reason why Many of us, many of us have tried individually to organize our work around our own personal theory of architecture, of urban planning, and for our own sake, we attempted doing things that were different than before. Because in the end, it is our duty to make these architectural gestures. Let me emphasize, we should make gestures that have been unknown thus far, at least publicly. And let me share a couple of examples from my own activity, because I know it better than the activity of anybody else. And then uh, I wouldn't like to use or exploit anybody else's work for the purpose of illustrating my point. So let me show you what I truly mean when I talk about avant-garde for its own sake. Right, so let me just try to change the slide. Okay, so the first thing that I wanted to discuss is the ecological approach. And here you also have the date when the project, the design was made. It was in 1967. And it was a design for the ESPO commune that was then part of Helsinki. This design uh, won a prize, and let me just remind you that in this period, the dominant type of projects were the ones that you can see in this slide. So the authors of this specific design decided to choose a different path. They decided to take into account the landscape in which they were working, the hills, forests, so they created um, cycling and pedestrian paths. This is something that newspapers write about so frequently today. And around that we built houses and added communication independently in valleys. So architecture, unlike what we are seeing in this previous photo, was supposed to look like this. Everything was meant to respond to the natural features of the existing landscape. So 
Unfortunately, something completely different was put in place, but it's a separate issue. Now on to another project from 1973. This is a spa district in Augustov. So the authors of this project, once again, maybe not even being aware of that, uh, took this ecological approach to designing and they planned, they designed residential houses, the spa centers uh, on the elevations in this area. They partly decided to leave the park as it was, leave the forest as it was. Unfortunately, once again, this project was not fully implemented, the environment was not conducive to this kind of urban planning, to this kind of spatial compositions that was too difficult for the authorities at that time to put in place. But let me just uh, re-emphasize that we are talking about 1973. Let me just skip the calculation of how many years ago that took place because, well, it would reveal how old I am. And one of the last projects that followed the same spirit. Uh, 2012, Lublin, the area of Podzamcze, so near the castle, and everything that was planned, designed in here was supposed to be reminiscent of the hills on which the castle is erected on the one side, while on the other hand, and on the other side, we have another hill that is overgrown with trees. So the valley that was to be developed with this commercial complex was supposed to be reminiscent of this great hall. So we wanted to add something on the roofs, um, and the roofs were supposed to be green, obviously. So the year was 2012, which means that from 1967 uh, to 2012, we have been repeating the same approach consistently. One more thing is the approach that I have called Stop Scroll. It, uh, uh, was in 1981, we didn't talk about sprawl at that time. But the project, the design, that started with some small studies aimed at addressing the issue of developing recreational areas around Warsaw in order to prevent the sprawl that we need to confront today. So we used the easiest thing possible around the Calvary Mountain, the Calvary Mountain, we planned several small villages, settlements, where the development, recreational holiday development was to be concentrated, that so many people wanted to have near their primary residence. So let me remind you that then we had these wonderful projects, these wonderful designs, such as the Federation of Small Towns near Poznań, which is partially has been partially put in place, unfortunately only partially, but this, in inverted commas, avant-garde approach to the way of thinking, um, our attempt at stopping the sprawl, well, can be visible in this design. And one more thing is the compact city, the compact city where you can reach everything you need within a 15 minutes walk, at least to achieve the goals that we need to achieve in our daily lives. So it is the design of walk also prepared for a competition in 1970 
one. At that point, nobody was talking about this 15 minutes, but in this specific project as well, as well as in the project of uh, restructuring ports put in uh, 1976, we clearly said that these urban centers need to be rethought, redesigned in such a way so that residents could reach all of their daily goals within 15 minutes. And we also made here something like a balance of a pedestrian and a time balance of a pedestrian. So we assumed that somebody who lived in the center of Putsk should be able to attain all of their goals within 15 minutes. So eventually, in 2010, with a group of students, we made designs for the city of Warsaw that um, designed three different types of paths, one of them for elderly citizens so that they could attain the goals that they want to attain relatively quickly. Then for people who are elderly yet ambitious that uh, may get there faster and one more path for people who uh, actually go across uh, the city regardless of what they uh, come across and are able to uh, overcome any obstacles as you can see in here. So people who are highly mobile. So to sum up, we could say that with respect to myself and other colleagues, I continue to use this word avant-garde in inverted commas because I don't want you to think that we are trying to compare ourselves to the true representatives of the avant-garde that all of the textbooks and all of the encyclopedias of architecture dedicate entire chapters to. But I believe that my team has nothing to be ashamed of because we have tried, we have tried to be consistent even though that we were nowhere to be found in official publications, we have tried and strived to pursue our own paths and we have continued to make these gestures that I consider to be our duty. And to conclude, I have brought with myself a book by Hanna Adamczewska, The Influence of the realizations of the implementation on um, urban design. So we talk a lot about flexible planning today. We say that our designs should be flexible and should be able to respond or take into account a number of modifications and changes to the urban environment. So many things that are around us. This book was written in 1964. It's not a new book, even though today Today, we talk about this different type of planning. Adam Czewska, based on her own experiences, because let me remind you that together with Kazimierz Weicher, she designed the only city of this size constructed in Poland. And based on these experiences, she wrote this book. This is the book that I return to from time to time. And when I was working on design to a larger scale in Warsaw, every time I try to remind about this book to everybody who are not doing something that I refer to as planning maneuvers. So without being inflexible and really sticking to a specific solution, we 
should be responsive and respond to this changing tissue of the urban of the urban environment. So an architect, an urban planner is obliged to make these new gestures, to make new designs for the city. They are obliged to make these gestures. Let me repeat that one more time. Based on the experiences that Adam Czerska is writing about. If some of you have not read it, unfortunately, the book has been only published in Polish, so I'm very sorry for those of you who cannot really read it, but we can always uh, help and summarize it if needed. I would like to recommend it to everyone. This is a truly avant-garde book, and without this book, it seems to me that our urban planning activity wouldn't be as elaborate as it is today. We would continue to draw designs, to talk about composition, because the three thirds of my life I have devoted to talking about uh, architectural composition, but, but sometimes I try to talk about something deeper, about something else. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> I hope that I have not extended my time slot too much. Okay, thank you, thank you.